So welcome to Essex Wildlife Trust's third webinar for our Urban Wildlife Champions and Wilder Communities. I am Danielle Carbot, the Wilder Communities Manager at Essex Wildlife Trust and lead the Urban Wildlife Champions and Next Door Nature Projects. I can spot some familiar names on here today and uh, many of you will have already met me in previous webinar sessions on a site visit, workshop, Facebook or email. But thank you very much for joining this morning. Um, as usual, this is a webinar, so you will not be able to turn your camera or microphone on. But if you have any questions, please do pop them in the chat and I will try and answer them at the end. Um, of course, you are also more than welcome to email me questions if they pop up at a later date. So session three this morning will focus on swifts, a species that has recently been added to the rest red list, meaning they are globally threatened and have suffered severe declines over the last 25 years. So I'm really pleased to know that some of you are looking to create swift projects in your town or village. OK, before we jump into the action talk and discuss some of the things you can do to support these birds in your town or village, we're first going to look at how to identify them and some key characteristics which, in my opinion, make them the most amazing birds on earth. This year, our Wild About Gardens campaign, in collaboration with the RHS, focused on our high flyers, so swifts, swallows and martins, and it can sometimes be really difficult to tell them apart. So this handy spot the difference image here has been taken from this year's guide and gives an excellent overview of how to tell them apart. All of these birds are migratory, so they're visitors to the UK over the summer months. So you'll only spot them from sort of late spring to early autumn, depending on how the season's going. The first thing to know is that swifts are the only higher flyers that are dark brown all over with a very faint white throat, which you often can't see. In fact, swifts can look black against the sky. They have long curving wings with fairly small forked tails. Uh, that actually, I think they've got the sort of the biggest wings um, out of all four on that image here, there. However, for me, the most important part to identifying swifts are its aerial movements. The common swift is built for stamina and extreme speed. And, and they are actually the fastest bird in the UK and can reach speeds of up to 70 miles per hour in level flight, which just means that they're flying horizontally without moving up or down. They pirouette and soar way above our heads in groups. And as they do this, they make a screeching call, which is very hard to miss. And um, these are sometimes called screaming parties. I have an audio here as an example, uh, but before I play it, just as a pre-warning, if you are wearing headphones, don't have the volume too high because um, it is very loud. Honestly, sometimes there's nothing better than stepping out of your house of an evening and hearing that sound. It is very loud, but it's a welcome sound. So that was a quick glance at identification, uh, but there's much more to Swifts than that. So I'm now going to go through some of those key characteristics and behaviours. Um, as I said, Swifts are mostly seen at flight um, at great heights, and this is because they eat, drink, bathe, sleep, mate, all on the wing. Uh, they're rather ungainly on land and are much more comfortable in flight um, and only ever perch or take a break to nest and breathe. So that's constant flight. Consequently, as I'm sure you can imagine, this means that they need a lot of energy and eat up to around a thousand insects in just one day. I mean, it's also said that they're about the same weight as a cream egg. Uh, just a little extra fact for you there. So the reason they are such great birds to support in our towns, cities or villages is because they have adapted wonderfully to live amongst humans, preferring to nest in our buildings, under roof tiles, in the eaves, small gaps or holes in the concrete. 
um, and they're often seen as the, the urban bird. Swifts prefer to build nests in these places just to give them height. Uh, the use of their legs is limited as they are very, very short and are primarily used for clinging onto vertical surfaces. And therefore, swifts don't settle voluntarily on the ground. Um, if you do see a swift on the ground, that is a grounded swift and is in trouble. So as a result, they leave their um, they, they build their nests at high heights. Um, and actually, when they're in their nest, they leave them by dropping into the air from the entrance. So it's quite an unusual move, uh, move unlike other birds that normally sort of springboard off a surface when taking flight. Swifts literally drop from their nest, which is why you need, uh, they need those nests to be nice and high, which is why buildings are their preferred sites. Um, the, the bottom left image there on the screen demonstrates this well. You can sort of see that swift coming straight out of the box, almost diving, falling, falling down first to take flight. And what swifts do is they, they gather material on the wing, such as feathers, straw, hay and seeds to create these nests and bind them together using their saliva. Once the nest is built, it is used year after year after year, with a few renovations now and then, of course. Um, they like to nest in colonies and pair and breed for life. So when you first hear those screaming calls, the ones I just showed you, um, from a swift in late spring, these are the breeders who come back first, sort of April, May time, and are fully matured, which is from four years old. The bangers return next May, June time and are usually around two to three years old. And then the yearlings who are one year old come last sort of June time. Once a swift is matured and becomes a breeder, they normally lay sort of two to at two or three day intervals in one season. And the bonded pairs share those parental duties. Um, on a previous slide, you might have noticed um, a swift with sort of a, a large, um, rather large neck. So to feed their young, Swifts form what is known as a bolus at the back of their throats where they store flying insects such as uh, moths and beetles they catch on the wing. Uh, they store this in that bolus, which can you know, hold around 100 insects all bound together uh, with the Swift saliva. And they use this to feed their chicks. I know, totally amazing. Um, however, before they are fully matured, and they build these nests and they provide their chicks with food. Um, they are called bangers because they are looking for prospective nest sites and they do this by brushing and banging their wings against the entrance. So we only see swifts in the UK over the summer months because swifts migrate from East Africa. Um, this fantastic illustration here has also been taken from the Wild About Gardens High Flyers Guide and gives you a great visual of the distance swifts travel. It's like an epic adventure from Eastern Africa all the way to the UK and back again. Um, the most fascinating thing about this migration is that swifts do this without landing. As mentioned before, they spend their entire lives on the wing other than for nesting and breeding. And this is also true for their long distance migration. So, Hopefully that gives you um, a flavour of why swifts are such amazing birds and hopefully has inspired you to get your swift project started for the year 2023 when they return to the UK. I know there are still some swifts about at the moment, um, but I know the heat has meant that many of them have bred very quickly and fledged very quickly. So um, in this instance, this webinar is very much here to help you with your project for 2023. Um, and with that in mind, the next part of our webinar today will be looking at the action you can take to ensure these birds are supported across Essex in our cities, towns and villages. So a bit of doom and gloom to start. Um, since 1994, swifts have actually declined by 53%. So although in many places you can still hear the screaming parties, I've got quite a few that fly over me um, during the summer months, their numbers are actually rapidly falling and there's only 59,000 estimated breeding pairs in the UK at the moment. So this means as mentioned, um, they are now on red conservation status. The main reason for this sad situation is habitat loss, increasingly severe weather on migration and insect food loss. Here in the UK, many of our older buildings have been renovated, redesigned or simply re replaced. Um, and as swifts nest sites are used 
year after year after year. If they're lost through development, this can cause serious problems during the breeding season. Further to this, with the loss of grassland habitats, those fantastic flower-rich meadows in our urban spaces, you know, on our road verges and, and green spaces, um, and increased pesticide use, it can become increasingly hard for swifts to find enough food. Recent tracking studies have shown that swifts can routinely fly 10 miles from their nest each day to find food. But of course, if, if not food, enough food is found, tired and hungry swifts can become extremely vulnerable. Um, climate change is also making it harder to migrate. With more extreme weather to tackle, some swifts arrive in the UK in poor condition, making successful breeding very unlikely. Um, lots of people would have probably noticed this year that the swifts actually arrived quite late. The swifts where I live were about sort of four to five days late, um, and that was because of some extreme weather that they experienced uh, in their migration. So there are some really key issues and, and major factors contributing to their decline. But it's not all doom and gloom, and we can support them here in the UK, even though they are only with us for, for around three months. The first and most obvious thing uh, you can do is, of course, installing swift nest boxes. Um, as mentioned, many, many of our newer buildings or buildings that have been renovated don't provide nest sites, either they have been blocked up or simply in, don't include space anymore, so nest boxes can't can be an invaluable addition to buildings. Um, as I'm sure you know, there are a number of resources out there, um, swift conservation being one of the best. So today I'm just going to show you some of the options out there. As a reminder, swifts love, love to nest in colonies. So within your swift project, it really is important to think carefully about where you are placing your nest boxes and getting as many people on board as possible. It is generally recommended that you have sort of two to four nest boxes on a single building. Houses, offices, apartment buildings, church towers, bridges and tall warehouses are all fantastic locations. Um, and here I've just given an example of where you might put a swift box on a house. So the boxes themselves should be placed at least five metres above the ground away from windows and away from any potential disturbance. For example, you can put them under the eaves or in gables or just high on the vertical wall. This is to ensure that they have enough space below to exit the box, because as I mentioned, they don't spring off. They just tend to sort of simply fall. This also means there should be nothing underneath the swift box obstruct obstructing the exit. For example, on the White House there on the PowerPoint, the red circle is just a suggestion of the perfect area for the box. Um, it's high enough, so it's got that five metres underneath and there is no obstruction below. Um, if you were to place the box instead above the window um, and above the door, you can see there's an apex roof which would create obstruction. So it really is best to find the sort of perfect location on the house or building that you're looking at. Um, again, on the other house there on the right, uh, the brick house, the red circle suggests the perfect area for the box at is it, as it is again high enough at that five metres. And although there is a door above that red circle, there's nothing creating an obstruction because the door is actually sunken into the wall. It really is important to ensure the nest bark boxes are at least five metres away from a tree as well. So not just five metres from a ground, at least five metres away from a tree. Um, and simply because predators such as cats or crows and magpies can use trees as perches to access these nest box entrance. Um, trees can also impede the entrance as they need a flight path. Also avoid um, fitting next nest boxes on very exposed, cold, wet or hot positions. Installing boxes so they face to an easterly aspect is preferred. But if there is enough shade, say from the eaves themselves, then a south or westerly aspect might also be possible too. This is a really good image here that just gives you an idea of, of the best locations for a nest box. Um, as always, this webinar will re be recorded, so you'll be able to go back and look at that. Here are just a few examples of some of the boxes that have been installed in the correct places on houses. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a number of designs you can choose from. 
Regarding the boxes um, themselves, they are easily available to buy online or you can build your own using DIY instructions. Again, uh, there's an example of this on the Wild About Gardens Higher Flyers Guide, uh, but both are great options. So the choice is very much dependent on your situation. If you're buying boxes, it may be that you hold a fundraising event in your village to raise these funds. Or once you've reached out to those who will be taking part in the project, they may be interested in buying the boxes themselves. If you're building the boxes, it really is key to find someone in your area that has the skills to do this. You may even be that person. Either way, the most important part is getting those in your town and village on board. So again, very much like other projects that I've been sharing via webinars, um, share your vision with your council. Get an idea of how many people would like to be involved, perhaps through Facebook. You can do sort of a survey monkey or local newsletter. Um, it may even be worth door knocking along the street that you're thinking about, perhaps doing the project on or even the whole village uh, to see who might be interested. So the more boxes that you can get installed, the more likely it will be that a colony of Swifts will use them. It is, however, sometimes a bit of a waiting game uh, when bangers, those swifts who are looking for nest sites uh, for breeding are exploring potential sites. They may visit and inspect um, the nest box that you put up for two to three years before actually nesting. So patience is key here. In most cases, it is better um, to put swift boxes in areas they are already nesting or close by to increase your chances. Um, using the RSPB SWIFT mapper is a good way of locating where your nearest SWIFTs are nesting or have been spotted. And I'll, I'll circle back to that later on in the webinar. Another really key point here is how to get uh, the nest boxes installed, because it's sort of all well and good saying go out and buy them, get as many people on board. But of course, you have to get them installed on those buildings or those sites. Um, across your street or in your village or city or wherever you're going to do it. So you can, of course, do this by yourself. Um, but if there are a number of boxes to be installed, this can be fairly time consuming. And of course, you need the correct equipment. Um, if you don't feel confident enough to do this yourself or perhaps you don't have the tools, then uh, we recommend reaching out to your local roofing company or building company or builder. And this can be really beneficial. And there's some great stories out there um, about making this connection. In some cases, you may be lucky and they support your project for free if you explain your vision and reasoning behind your action for SWIFT. Or again, you can use a fundraising event uh, that could be in, put in place to raise money to pay for the roofing company to put up um, the SWIFT boxes or the building company or the builder, however you choose to go about it. Um, if fundraising is also not something you're really keen on testing out it may be that you can access pots of funding as well and um, if you're already part of a community group that are looking to do this that is constituted and has a bank account um, then you can look out for funding that you can access as a side note there i always flag any available pots of community funding on our monthly urban wildlife champion newsletter you receive those on the 13th or 14th of every month. So please keep an eye out for these as they can very, be very useful if you're looking for pots of community funding. In terms of the boxes themselves, there's so many you can buy um, at the moment from various different companies and, and online shops. So I've just put up a few um, that I know certain groups have used or I know are of good quality. The first being Schwegler. Uh, this is a key company. It's quite a large company um, and they produce great swiftness boxes, really, really cool designs. And you can buy these on various sites, for example, Wild Care. Um, you've also got uh, Genesis Nest Boxes. Uh, they're great and they're actually manufactured by hand in Ireland. You've also got Peak Boxes, which is a company in the Peak District. Uh, they create specialised swift nest boxes. So if you're looking for maybe um, two or three nests in one box or look, you're looking for certain shapes. Um, and then for something a little bit different, you've also got Impeccable. These are made in North Wales and they have some really quirky designs. So if you want something cool on the side of your house, I definitely recommend them. 
Um, and also the RSPB supply them on their shop too. Uh, costs can range from sort of £30 all the way up to 300 depending on what you're looking for. So it's really good to get out and have a look and do a bit of research about what boxes um, are right for your project. So alongside installing swift nest boxes and um, providing a food source is also really important. Um, so you can put up as many nest boxes as you like, but if the swifts don't have that food source that we were speaking about, because um, you know they catch these moths and flying beetles on the wing, they're not going to choose the area to nest in. So as, as previously mentioned, that is one of the reasons for their decline, the lack of insect food. Many of our gardens or green spaces lack the floral species that many of our invertebrates depend on. And so gardening with swifts in mind or green space management with swifts in mind will help to increase the insects available. Um, for many birds, we often suggest putting extra food out, but of course with swifts, they feed on the wings. So they really do need that abundance of flying insects. Um, a wildflower meadow is, of course, the best option here. And if you want further details on how to manage areas for grass and habitat in your garden or on your local green space, then please refer back to um, our previous webinar, which you can find on Essex Wildlife Trust YouTube channel. I go into lots of detail about how to create, protect and enhance wildflower meadows, those grassland species, which can help a variety of species, including swifts. However, um, if those in your SWIFT project don't have the space for wildflower meadows or the creation of these grassland habitats in your green spaces is not an option, then this image here from the Wild About Gardens Higher Flyers Guide is a great starting point. Insect friendly planting is key alongside the eradication of pesticide use to ensure the insect's population is as healthy as possible. This is really essential. Um, a source of water is also a great addition. Uh, there's a, a, on this uh, image here, there are some great bog garden plants suggested, such as common valerian, purple loosestripe, and water forget-me-not. Um, I found in my garden this year that betian, mullion, uh, betany, sorry, mullion and foxgloves were hit with a variety of insects. So if you need help, with what actions to take for insects in your garden, please visit our Action for Insects page on Essex Wildlife Trust. And um, you have to go to the Get Involved section. Um, you may also be interested in our Big Wild Seed Sow campaign, which is launching on the 10th of August this year. Um, you'll be able to get your hands on a free seed packet if you visit one of your local, local nature discovery centre or parks. And these are specifically for garden use. So do go along and grab those if you're interested in perhaps, yeah, creating some insect friendly planting across the gardens in your SWIFT project for 2023. Do also look out for National SWIFT Awareness Week, which started in 2018. Uh, we were actually the first country to do this. Um, and this year it was from the 2nd to the 10th of July. Um, and if you get your project up and running for the year 2023, it would be a great way of celebrating your project and also raising further awareness um, to more residents or other towns and villages that can follow suit. This week is led by Swift, Swift Con Conservation, sorry, getting my words muddled up there, Swift Conservation, uh, who I mentioned earlier. And there is a Facebook Swift Awareness page and Twitter account that you can follow for further updates. Um, I should mention that Swift Conservation have their own website as well, and it's a fantastic place to go for any advice. Um, I actually used their website recently for an issue that I had on my roof because I do actually have Swifts and um, Starlings nesting up there. And they've got some really key information, sort of leaflets that you can look at, advice and um, the law around nesting and things like that. So they are a fantastic resource. Um, I've just spotted that someone's popped their hand up. What I'm going to do is if you've got any questions, we're going to save it to the end, just in case I answer them in the next slides um, and just so I don't get lost where I am. But I've, I've got you on my radar. If you're also looking to further your knowledge on SWIFT, then I'll definitely recommend this book on the screen as well by Sarah Gibson. Uh, she works for Shropshire Wildlife Trust and it explores what is known about these fascinating birds and it gives you some insights into what people are doing across the UK to reverse their decline. So I definitely 
would recommend that as some reading material if you've got the time. Um, I also mentioned the SWIFT mapper earlier, which you can find on RSPB's website. It is a fantastic tool that I highly recommend. Um, if you go on there, you get access to a map and you can see where screaming parties have been seen. Uh, you can find where occupied nests are currently, or you can also find um, where previously occupied nests are. And you can also log on there the nest boxes that you install. So it can be such a fantastic re resource to help you set up your project, but also to log the activity throughout your project. So I would really recommend having a little browse on there and looking at your area, see what's happening already, because uh, it can help you with where actions should maybe take place. It could also help you find out um, where other people are taking action, maybe find some of those further links. So uh, a fantastic resource that I would highly recommend. Um, I did mention in uh, the sort of event that we would have Claire Rohde with us today. Unfortunately, she can't she couldn't actually come to the live webinar itself, but um, we have done a pre-recorded interview to share with you. So Claire Rohde is a resident in West Burkholt, a parish council within Colchester Borough. Uh, she's very kindly agreed to sharing her experiences setting up the West Burgholt Swift project and um, an amazing idea that led to some fantastic outcomes. So I've got that video uh, pre-recorded today, which I'm just going to play in a moment. Once we've gone through that video, we'll then have um, some finishing off questions. So I hope you enjoy the video and get some ideas and inspiration from there. Um, I also apologise, the colour of my face in the video is very odd. It's strangely orange and I'm not sure why. There's some sort of light issue, uh, but I hope that doesn't distract you from uh, a really good interview with, uh, with Claire Rohde. So please do enjoy that. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for coming along today, Claire, and having a chat about your SWIFT project. Um, I've got a few questions uh, just for my Urban Wildlife Champions so they can hear about a real life project. So my first one is, what was the motivation behind setting up the SWIFT project in West Burgholt? Okay, so I moved um, to West Burgholt about six years ago, and prior to that I'd lived in the middle of Colchester, and I didn't have a huge amount of wildlife in the middle of Colchester that I could um, notice, but the Swifts were really obvious. They lived in the terraced houses in Newtown and they would all scream past every summer. Um, just so atmospheric, I loved it. And I moved back to Burgholt and although I'm in the countryside and very rural, there were no Swifts here and um, I really missed them. And I remember seeing a Swift kind of really high up going heading towards Colchester thinking oh, okay you're off to to Colchester and I thought what if we could get them here it'd be just amazing um and there was just the seed of an idea then and um thought well maybe if I got a few people interested and it's not just me because I know they like to live in colonies and um a few here and there might not be enough so I just thought maybe I'll do something about that. Maybe I can get some other of the villagers involved uh, and interested. Um, and yeah, so that's what I decided to do. I mean, yeah, it's interesting that you said that obviously you came from Colchester and so mm -hmm. you were really familiar with Swift. So I live in Lee in Southend um, and Swifts, yeah, have always been part of my everyday life. Mm. Um, so imagining not hearing the screeching is an odd, an odd thought so yeah. I can imagine yeah. that would have been a massive push once you were out of Colchester <laughs> not hearing that every year definitely <laughs> okay so after you decided that you wanted Swifts in the area how did you involve and engage the community as you said you wanted more people on board mm. how, how did you go about that um I started off by putting a post on our village Facebook page um just to say does anyone know of any Swifts in the village I haven't seen or heard any um if there are I'd love to hear about them um if not does anyone fancy putting some boxes up maybe trying to get some in the village um and I'll see what I can do about fundraising things like that um and I got quite a few responses so I thought right I'll set up a Facebook group for these people and we can start talking I made some posters and stuck them up around the village as well um because not everyone's on Facebook obviously and um 
we just all got talking and a few people were like, yeah, I want boxes. Um, some of them were just interested, didn't necessarily want boxes or um, or had the, the right property to put boxes up on, but really still wanted to follow the journey. So um, from that point, I was like, right, I've got this many people. Um, I spoke to the parish council as well um, because they I thought it would be nice to get them on the public buildings. Um, so we've got some uh, on the village hall, on the main village hall, the Auburn Hall. Um, parish council actually said that they would fund theirs. And um, I spoke to the school as well, who did a little fundraiser. They've got an eco council, so they raised enough money from a non-uniform day um, to fund their part of the project as well. And all the other individual households we funded separately. But um, I had um, eight households all together, which I thought oh. was a really good number. Yeah, amazing for sort of that initial push. It sounds to me like getting out and reaching some of the sort of key stakeholders quite important, like the parish council and, and the schools. Yeah, um, it was good. Was it sort of, yeah, was it that sort of first initial really good reaction when you spoke about it? Yeah, definitely. Literally, I didn't have to fight for it. They were all very receptive. Brilliant. Perfect situation then. Yeah. OK, so obviously you've been through that process. Do you have any any advice? Sort of what advice would you give someone who's starting from scratch a SWIFT project in their town or village? OK, so I know I knew a little bit about SWIFT anyway, just from the brief research I'd done, but I'm no expert. I got in touch with uh, SWIFT Conservation, who were really, really important in giving me advice on the positioning of boxes and um, also swift behaviour and what to expect and how long it might take and things like that, keeping it realistic because it can take a few years to get going. Um, and also um, the knowledge about putting the call devices up with uh, with the boxes. Um, and I really, that has just been so valuable to me all throughout, like every site I went to, I photographed it, I sent it off and they were great at giving me advice and sort of I learned a lot from that. So I started to sort of get my own ideas of what was working and what wasn't and sort of just double checked it with them. And they were like, yeah, you've got it. So um, feeling pretty confident about advising people now without double checking. But um, I'd say if you are starting from scratch, definitely get expert advice because Swifts are really um, particular birds with specific needs. Yeah, absolutely. And and even the website itself is quite handy, isn't it? Swift Cons yeah. Conservation. They've got lots yeah. of PDFs and, yeah. and online resources, haven't they? So it's definitely yeah. a wonderful place to start. Mm -hmm. um, can you share any of your sort of top experiences since starting the project? What have you enjoyed most? Um, one of the best bits to start off with was just meeting people who felt the same as me, who were just as passionate as me about Swifts and about wanting to help them. and um, not just the people who funded, because we had fun, we had funding from various sources, but the people who wanted the boxes on their houses. Um, it was just lovely. Just, I mean, we put the boxes up during the 2020 sort of lockdown period. We were able to do it because it was outside, and we had a volunteer builder who was happy to go up a ladder for us. Um, but it was just an opportunity to speak to people that to meet people I hadn't met before love meeting new people and that was just really wonderful and then we've been very lucky at my own house that we've had three years worth of ch uh, swifts nesting in one of our boxes and watching them chick grow on the camera and then fledge has been amazing we've had the first two years they had two chicks and this year they had three they fledged last week and um, yeah, it was just wonderful to see them just go out and spread their wings and and add to the numbers. Would you recommend potentially getting a, a camera then for some of the boxes to add interest to you? Yeah, I would. There was a, a couple of people um, on the project decided they wanted cameras as well. They, that was um, at their own expense and um, actually the school decided to go for a camera too um, and at the moment they haven't had the same luck with the with the camera boxes as we have but when the time comes it's really invaluable I think particularly for the school from an educational point of view. Yeah absolutely I mean we've got quite a few webcams for sort of different things and we find that they have quite you know quite a lot of um, interest so 
yeah. I think it would be an amazing thing uh, to do to to just yourself see see what the Swifts are doing. But as you say, it takes them sometimes a bit of time, doesn't it, to mm. actually decide to nest in in a Swift box. So <laughs> patience yeah. is key. <laughs> Absolutely, ours was quite uh, unusual where where they came first year that we put the call device on they came and nested and this year we've had um, another one of our sites has been successful they've had swift nesting as well amazing and, and when you say a, a call device what what mm. what does that do what does that sort of um, try and achieve so that's a, a little tweeter connected to an amplifier and you have to put it next to the boxes and it basically if you put it on evenings and mornings um, the Swifts will hear it. It's basically a, a recording of their own call and they it just gives them a signal to come down and have a look and see what's available down there because it makes them think someone else might be nesting nearby. Um, and as I and say, you, they like to they like to nest in groups. So. So do you think the the caller that you had mm -hmm. was maybe the influence between them yeah. choosing your Swift yeah. box? Yeah. I don't think they would have come and had a look if it wasn't there. I think it's one of those things that every Swift box, if you've got Swift boxes, you should definitely have one of those. Oh, great, great bit of advice. I haven't got one of mine, so maybe that's something I should be doing because, yeah, they haven't they haven't picked mine yet. So, yeah, <laughs> it will speed things up a bit, I reckon. Yeah. Amazing. So, yeah, talking about um, obviously the, the boxes, have you seen an increase um, in Swifts in West Burkholt then from from this project? Yes, absolutely. We have. I mean, we did see a few of them beforehand sort of feeding up high. We've got quite a few fields around here, um, but they were never as low down as they are. Now we get little screaming parties of about six or eight um, around here. And obviously we know we've had chicks fledging from here now so the numbers are definitely increasing oh, fingers crossed that continues then through the years I look, look forward to finding out <laughs> <laughs> so um as you were engaging obviously you found that there were quite a few people uh, that were interested in joining the project and I think sometimes that's the key you often feel a bit alone don't you before you actually reach out mm. um, but did you find there were any maybe misconceptions that you had to address during the project launch um, the main thing was people thought that swallows were swifts. Um, that's really, really common. Um, so just trying to explain, oh, you, a lot of people think they've seen swifts perching on things and they're like, if it's a swift, it's not perching anywhere. <laughs> yeah. they, don't, they don't come down unless it's to nest. So, um, And also people wanting to put boxes um, on bungalows, which don't necessarily have the height required for a swift to nest in it. So just not necessarily misconceptions, but just um, just people needing um, to learn about it. Really. Um, but yeah, that was that. I, I wouldn't have said there was anything more than that. Oh, brilliant. So it hasn't been too difficult to implement then, because, you know, th those two examples you gave, yeah, they're quite, quite easy to address just through, yeah, informal chats and a little bit of uh, education, because yeah, as you say, not everybody knows that Swifts mm -hmm. literally spend all their life uh, in the air, aerial birds. So um, it's an, an interesting one to talk about. OK, and as we're talking about Swifts, lastly, what is your favourite thing about Swifts? <laughs> it's got to be the sound. <laughs> It's the sound of summer for me. Um, I just love it. It's really just so atmospheric. And when they arrive, it's, it's just the best sort of signal for me that, yeah, the weather's getting better and, and they're here for a few weeks. And um, just really exciting watching their um, aerial displays. Just amazing. Amazing birds. And you can watch it for some time, can't you? Especially if it's good weather. Mm -hmm. They really do put on a show. <laughs> a flying ant day they love flying ant day <laughs> yeah we haven't had ours here yet ah. um but we still have got some swifts remaining yeah. so fingers yeah. crossed i'll be able to see that <laughs> okay well thank you very much for having a chat with us today and um, yeah fingers crossed we'll start to see a few more swift projects across essex <laughs> yeah good luck if you try it guys okay back to me the the in-person me um i hope you enjoyed hearing uh, about Claire Rohde's experience in West Burkholt and I hope it gave you some extra ideas. Uh, it definitely helped me with thinking about potentially getting a Swift caller uh, to try and entice those Swifts to come in 2023 and nest in the box that I've put at the back of my house. So yeah, um, we've come to the end of the webinar now. So if you've got any questions, I know someone did put their hand up 
Um, if you want to ask a question, if you look at the top of the webinar, there's just a little uh, sort of round uh, speech bubble with the word chat underneath. So if you pop your questions in the chat there, um, I can try and answer them. So I think Diane, was it you that maybe put your hand up? Um, just if you put it, pop it in the chat there, uh, just because we can't turn microphones and cameras on uh, for this session. So, yeah, any questions, just pop them in the chat and I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, of course, if questions pop up uh, maybe later, then absolutely send me an email. And of course, um, if you do need any advice, uh, I know Claire already mentioned that she obviously sent pictures to Swift Conservation um, and kept sort of getting feedback. Uh, you are more than welcome to email with me with your ideas. If I haven't met you yet and you've got a SWIFT project that you're thinking about creating, I can come and do a site visit. It's absolutely, you know, um, we're here to help you and it's absolutely fine to email with me with uh, anything that pops into your mind. Um, yeah, so thank you, Diane. Yeah, so do SWIFT feed at night. So, yes, it's the the swift, the different type of swifts out of different types, uh, different times of the day. So, for example, often the screaming parties, the most sort of active swifts can be those younger ones. Um, and they, they normally happen sort of in the evening, late afternoon. So they tend to be feeding sort of later on in the day and then through the night as well. But the screaming parties do sort of finish off. Uh, you don't tend to hear them in the, the middle of the night. Um, again, yeah, another question here. Can any other birds use swift boxes? So there are some uh, boxes that you can get that are for swallows and swifts and I think house sparrows as well. It's like a universal box. But if you're getting a specialised swift nest box, no, the only bird that can use them is a swift. If you'd like more information about the universal nest box, just send me an email and I can send you through a link so you can look at that. Um, you can get some really amazing ones now where it's sort of a long, long line of different types of nest boxes. Or yes, you can just get one nest box that's sort of fitted out for a variety of migratory birds. So yeah, if you would like more information about the sort of universal nest box, let me know. Um, what other insect besides beetles and moths do swifts eat? So there isn't a huge um, amount of research about the types of insects that swifts eat, but the general gist is that it's any type of flying insect. So um, obviously, depending on when they're feeding, and as I said, it's normally in the sort of late evening, sort of as we move into the night, it is generally mostly moths. Um, but as long as you put in sort of some, you know, plant, uh, plant uh, insect friendly planting, sorry, then you're more than likely to welcome a variety of invertebrates to your garden and fingers crossed some of those flying insects. And as, as Claire mentioned in the interview just there as well, they like flying ants too. So it really is flying insects in general, um, but there isn't actually a huge amount of research. Um, I think there's some handy guides on uh, sort of eating habits on swift conservation. I can have a look through there and send across an answer, see if there's any more uh, specific insects out there that they, they do eat. But those are the three that I'm aware of. So um, what plants are good for insects and larvae? Oh, so this is Diane again, yeah. So I did actually send through um, some information to Jenny with a variety of plants and insects that use them for um, sort of yeah food for their larvae because it can be um, quite a complex uh, relationship between invertebrate and plant. For example, ragwort, which is often something that's removed, it is a fantastic plant for a variety of species. For example, the cinnabar moth. Um, but there's so many different relationships out there. I can resend that email to you, Diane, because it's um, a really good list of plants and then the insects uh, that rely on them for their larvae. So it's it's a good place to start. Um, and again, yeah, can help you with with which plants to put in your garden. Again, the idea of having maybe a, a a bog in there as your water source can be great because they do attract more flying insects than anything else as well. So I do re really recommend that as an action if you can take it. And, and bog gardens can be quite small as well. You don't need sort of a massive pond or, or anything like that. So, 
Yeah, there's there's lots of um, information about there out there about insects, and you, there are a number of actions you can take. So my general advice is um, do the actions that you can. Uh, on our website, there are loads of different things that you can do to bring insects into your garden or into your green spaces. Um, if you go on sort of the top of the website, there's a few tabs. Um, there's a get involved section with some ideas. That's where you can see um, the big wild seed. So um, and there's also then what the wildlife section. If you go down there at the bottom, it just says actions. And then there's loads of different things you can scroll through to give you some some ideas. So, yeah, I hope today has been uh, as useful as it can be. Uh, again, as I said to Diane, do ping me through emails and I'll try to get as much information out there as possible because, you know, a 45 minute to an hour webinar is difficult to fit everything in. But yeah, good luck uh, if you do start thinking about your project um, and yet yeah, do ask for support if you need it. Um, I can come along and have a look. I recently went to Fingham Ho because there's potentially going to be a SWIFT project there and just had a look at some potential sites. So if you really do need help with where to put these nest boxes in, I'm more than happy to come and have a look. So, yeah, thank you for coming along, guys, um, and have a lovely rest of your day. Uh, the next webinar uh, will be in September. Um, I have sent through on the Urban Wildlife Champions newsletter a list of the webinars all the way through to December because there's one each month for 2022 with varying topics. So do have a look on there and sign yourself up uh, to so some of the up and coming webinars if they're relevant to your project. OK, well, thank you very much, guys, and speak to you soon, hopefully. See you later.